Thank you. Uh, James Logan from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I have a, a question for uh, Gay Gibson. Uh, thanks for a, a lovely talk there. Um, and really interesting to see your last slide um, on the trap that you're developing in the field. I think that looks really exciting. And, and it's something that I've sort of been talking about for a while as, as well. Why do we quite often just focus on one sense when we should be combining them? Um, and you know, creating sort of super traps, as it were, which looks like exactly what you're, you're trying to do there. Um, one question I had, though, was that, so the comparison that you have is between uh, a human landing catch and the trap, and it seems like, obviously, the trap is collecting significantly more um, mosquitoes, and I wondered whether um, you're sort of almost overshooting the mark. So, you know, if we use traps for surveillance or for determining biting rates, for example, perhaps it's just too attractive and isn't representative of, of, of a human. So in, in that case, are you thinking about using that type of trap for control rather than surveillance? And also whether you could just comment on the, on the sort of uh, possibility of using traps for control of mosquitoes. Um, just to go back to James' sort of initial ask the question was about whether the human landing catches were catching so many fewer than people trap. What does that mean? And what, what are we measuring in terms of surveillance? Um, higher populations, lower populations, or what? And I think that um, there's a lot, it, it, it's just broken up in so many questions to be able to catch that many mosquitoes with just the, the sensory cues. So some of it could be that the traditional human landing catch is an underestimate the actual person who's catching them is busy all the time, turning on the torch, moving about, catching it, putting them away. So that's not the normal behavior of a host at night time. So it could be that um, those are host defensive behaviors, as far as the mosquito is concerned, and they really don't um, get caught. And you can't catch them behind you, and so forth. So that there's a potential that um, the decoy traps more accurate, more accurate. Um, Especially as we get to very high densities, there's going to be an effect where a person just can't keep track of that many mosquitoes, so they can't plateau the hour with the human landing catch, presumably. But everything I'm saying right now is speculation, and that's why we're delighted to have this MRC support to learn more about it. And yet, it, it would be lovely to see it turn into a control trap, especially as it seems to be very effective. Very good. So, any other questions? Maybe following the theme of mosquitoes, but also widening it out to the other biting flies, perhaps, or the innocent bites and the snails. Yeah, just one, one more. I was just going to say we did actually bring a trap with us, so anyone who's interested to see what this looks like in a patch, it's, we have it set up on the table. Question from uh, Dr. Emery. So that gives the game away, doesn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Great talks this morning. I'm, I'm very struck by the, well, I've always been very struck by the difference between an intermediate host and a vector, and that the intermediate host is, only, is kind of doing half the job of the vector in, in doing the you know, asexual amplification of the parasite. But the parasite is then going on to do the host seeking itself. We know quite a lot about host seeking in all the in both the um, larval stages of schistosomes. Um, why aren't we why aren't we using that as a control measure, Russ? I guess I, I will answer that question and deflect it to my vector colleagues. Basically, because we don't have a discipline which looks at we might say host finding behaviour of parasites meshed into the, the, the knowledge that some of have left, left to control. So perhaps that's something some of our vector friends might be illuminated to know that whilst they're still in the organism, you know, we don't we have a subcellular understanding, for example, of malaria parasites and how they have tissue trophisms and how they can do this just as they slightly different as the matrix is bigger. But perhaps I'll pass that over to our colleagues and vector biologists say, well, you know, how would you go about it if you didn't have a discipline to support that research which was going on, but it bites on the schistosomiasis. and wasps. So, any volunteers, or should I just point, point the finger directly to Amy with the knowledge of the subcellular biology of uh, volatiles and also the malaria life cycle? Well, I think. <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> Can you reiterate exactly the question? Sorry. So, the, um, the, the snail intermediate host doesn't have the host seeking behaviour, but the parasite does, and we know a certain amount of. Uh, what schistosomes are attracted to. 
Um, but we, it's never been, as far as I know, Russ, applied on any kind of scale. Um, you know, as a control measure. You know, so can obsidian or miracidian. Um, I noticed that Russ had some slow release. Uh, he was using some slow release. Um, Things. Uh, you, um, is there a potential there for having a slow release attractor? No, of course, but I'll let you pass on that question. Does that frame the. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think absolutely, because it's obviously crucially important for the. Is it schistosomial, the one that goes into the skin? They use the, the cues from the skin, it absolutely governs transmission. And as we all know, transmission. It's it's vitally important. It's the it's a population bottleneck, um, and if you if you can interrupt transmission, as we all know, then it's 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 a massively helpful way of controlling disease. We know they're using cues to fine tune the skin. I think that's that's been shown. Um, that will be volatile chemicals. So I think that is a, a, a fantastic way of of exploiting the, the knowledge that we have on kind of parasite host interactions. And yes, I. If I, I see no reason, obviously I don't know that system, but I see no reason why you couldn't create a synthetic version of that and kill them. It, it, obviously it would work best, as, as we were just saying with Kay Gibson, with her trap, which is actually more attractive than humans. If, you've got, if you can get something that functions like that, then absolutely, yeah. I think it takes a lot of characterization and it takes a lot, like we've developed these compounds, but then, or, sorry, we haven't developed them, we've isolated the compounds in, in humans. And we think they're attractive, but talking about the malaria system, but we're we're still quite far away from being able to implement that in the field. Although we're we're, we're getting closer, it does take a lot of work. But if, yeah, I think it's a fantastic tool, and it's obviously non-invasive. It's 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 a really great way. So yeah, I think there is potential there. So thanks for that question. Just to help Ellie out, because I know how to press, but I'll ask a question to Ellie. Just something which is quite important, when you consider someone who's got malaria, often you've got elevated temperature and fever, so some of the volatility of the compounds themselves might be elevated because the fever stage of the patient or the person. So, maybe just to help you out a little bit, have you got any insights into you know, that aspect? People, you know, fever cases, are they more attractive to a, a mosquito or less attractive, or is it just the qualitative volatiles that are coming off irrespective of the temperature? So in my study, everybody was asymptomatic and everybody did, had a temperature under 37.5, so nobody had a fever. We hypothesized that it was specifically the skin volatiles and it wasn't the influence of fever. Um, there's lots of reasons for this, but the primary transmission of malaria in an endemic setting is not from febrile people with what we call acute phase malaria. It's these persistent chronic low-grade infections. It's people have had, or children, that have had malaria for a long time, it's at a low level, but they highly produce gametocytes, which is the transmissible stage. So if, if really it was only febrile patients, it wouldn't make much sense in an endemic setting. But there is... It might be that the mosquito is less attractive to a fever case, perhaps go to a symptomatic point. Yeah, so there is, um, not necessarily in people, but in a different parasite, malaria parasite system, in avian malaria, they did show that actually people, uh, the birds were less attractive when they had the um, the fever so in the acute phase so there is some evidence to suggest that but also in malaria then you have the transmissible stages even during this phase so it doesn't necessarily make sense for that person not to be attractive at all because you can still transmit good so i think we've covered a bit of ground on malaria and schistosomiasis for those i want to expand it onto you know, perhaps leishmaniasis or um, viruses zikas and, and uh, yellow fevers Obviously, that's killed the discussion flat. So let's, let's stick back on uh, the malaria, perhaps. Any, any further questions on malaria and schistosomiasis? And I'll perhaps pose a question to one of the, uh, the panelists. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to start with you, Ellie. Um, thank you for your excellent talk. It's been really interesting. So I have a question for Teresa. So it's very exciting your proposed project on the uh, Casper technology for cell. Why well, does I understand it? The, um, Genetics of um, cell intermediate hosts is not so well understood at the moment. And I was just wondering, sort of, A, which species are thinking to target first, and B, what, what sort of other knowledge you'll need to sort of gain before you can really actually target the CRISPR, CRISPR technology. You're mentioning a very interesting point, and that is the fact that there are different um, snail species that obviously act as an intermediate host, and in order to make 
that solution um, a sustainable and a solution that is applicable and in many areas you would kind of have to look at at all at the different species and try to modify them we'd start with um, the snail species that is most predominant biofilaria and um, we um, yeah we had initially um, had a look at potential sites where we could actually do field trials and based on on um, the dominant predominance of the snail populations there we we chose um, the snail um, biofilaria and we are generally interested I mean it's it's such an exciting technology that hasn't yet been shown with snails and so um, and and the genome of some snails has just been um, published so we are obviously first of all interested in whether it works um, and which um, methods and approaches are are the best to also be um, suited for um, other modifications later on and if some of the things we discover are applicable to other uh, vectors um, as well. Good, so we'll move on. Any further questions? No. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I've got a quick question kind of related to a few of you. Starting um, with Russ, you talked a bit about focal muscle side, and obviously that's really important. So, you know, using these maybe potentially dangerous chemicals in large areas and lakes and things like that. But then we need to know where to use these focal muscle sides, and we've been using um, GIS technology to find out where people might be getting infected. But maybe it is more important to be doing surveillance of the intermediate host and looking at where these species are present in um, large areas and then really um, focalizing on particular spaces. So that's also relevant for Teresa. If you're going to implement these snails with um, resistant genes, where would you eventually put those? But then I'd kind of like to point that question towards Mark. Mark saying, I'm thinking about how you, um, when you're doing your surveillance, the way you're going to release um, mosquitoes. Is there a lot of surveillance before that? Where the best places to hit? Or is it more of a kind of shotgun approach of um, releasing mosquitoes in a, a large, large area, not necessarily looking at where transmission and where the, the, um, the vector would be? I think to answer that's a great point, Tom. I think bringing Paul and that Mark made good and Mark because I think the vector surveillance for sandflies has the same thing. So perhaps Paul, if you make a comment, and then Mark will take over for from the cognitive aspect. Yeah, I did. I think I did such a good job of um, ensuring that everybody knew that we know very little about lesion analysis <laughs> and sandflies. It's sort of um, it's left a vacuum for questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where to target the control of sandflies? I mean, if we take the Indian subcontinent, um, because you see sandflies in large quantities around cattle, you see them entering people's rather open, simple huts, it's thought that indoor residual spread should have a big effect. Recent work has shown that you get very large populations away from the houses, up at the top of palm trees, away from cattle populations as well. And it becomes increasingly clear we don't really know where you should be applying your insecticides or other intervention methods. And I think the general point here is that you might have all sorts of wonderful methods of intervention, including genetic manipulation. But how are you going to demonstrate that one or more of these methods, isolation or in combination, actually is having an effect on the incidence of the infections, on the incidence of the diseases? And this requires transmission modeling. And we haven't really heard very much about that today. And you realize somewhere like the Indian subcontinent that this is essential. You take anthropomotic visceral leishmaniasis. Anthropomotic, it should be very easy to control. Identify the cases, treat them, the disease should disappear. Perhaps some um, insecticides to bring down the transmission rate. But how can you actually identify the cases fast enough to stop those cases being sources of infection? This requires transmission modeling we need to identify the number of days that you've got to identify the 
infected cases, the human cases, treat them, stop them being a source of infection. So I think Mark makes some excellent points the fact that as if there are other viruses are much more acute and less chronic than the least. So Mark, would you like to say how you kind of match that surveillance and targeting the infected people? Yeah, so I think it's a good question. Um, and I think you use the terminology shotgun. Is it a shotgun approach or a rifle? And, and the answer is it's probably somewhere between. So we will be guided, in, for example, in Brazil by the municipality. They will identify an area. The team will go in and look at that area. They will look at the density of the population of human beings. They will look at the movement of population in and out. Uh, and they will look at clearly the population of mosquitoes before we start a program. So those are the three things that happen before we go in. And then the monitoring, the tracking is, is just as I described. So there is quite a lot of groundwork. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a rifle, but neither is it a shotgun. Any thoughts from the floor? On that, on that, so some new questions to uh... Yeah, no, it's not really. Mary's doing the best to bring it. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong one. No problem. We'll have to tell you what might pass one of these up in the meantime. Uh, it's just a uh, follow up question from Paul, really, regarding. Um, the Leishmaniasis um, Indian subcontinent program that you did mention that there's been quite good success in Pakistan and Nepal and um, perhaps less um, progress um, uh, in India. Is there any understanding as to why that is? Um, I'm not sure that it's been um, accepted officially but the transmission modelers are pretty sure that in India the cases, the human cases, are not being detected quickly enough. So they remain a source of infection. Yeah. I think we've got a question up at the back, so maybe the microphone will speedily go to the back. I can hear you if you listen to it. <laughs> So I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. So we we'll think a bit deeper if you want to ask them to the time to run out. So, um, my question is um, again for Teresa on looking at the biology of the snail and the fact that um, they are hermaphroditic and what implications that may have on using this technology um, with the ability to self-fertilize or not and. Are you thinking of using CRISPR alongside other um, control methods to clear the population first? Because you only need one snail remaining that isn't resistant, as Russ highlighted in his um, in his talk, um, for that potential haystack burning scenario. <laughs> That's the rifle and the shotgun for the haystack as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the advantage of the CRISPR technology is that um, once it's in the germline, it actually um, propagates through all um, progenies. So um, if we kind of take um, the Oxitec approach, where you also kind of want to decrease um, the population below a limit that is um, needed um, for disease transmission, we um, would certainly, well, the, the idea would certainly be that at some point um, there would only be um, snails that cannot be infected by schistosomes in this um, specific location. Um, but it would also already help to just decrease the number of snails to a level um, below the, the current one, where you can then um, prevent the reinfection of individuals that have just been treated um, with medication. So um, in the for the interim time, it would be ideal if it could be a method that is used alongside education um, and uh, therapeutics, diagnostics. But if it was successful, it could potentially um, be used more standalone to um, yeah, to really help uh, take away the, the intermediate snail vector, which is needed for, for the schistosomes. And we have been wondering whether then there is the potential that maybe the schistosome is, is looking for a new host. Um, and that is obviously something that we can't, that we don't know yet, but um, the chances that that would happen is as likely as with any other um, vector that, that's been um, modified. Okay. 
Good, thank you, Dr. Reza. So, one final question from the floor. If not, then what we'll do is we'll get each of the panelists to sum up with the reflection, perhaps a thought, even a word of wisdom. But, uh, no questions from the floor? So, perhaps it's best if I go in the reverse panel of. Uh, uh, all the talks that have got a very short memory, as you know, so it's perhaps easy to go back to Mark's talk, which was first on the panel but last on the session. So, Mark, any reflections? So, I think one of the common themes I've picked up from what I've heard today is that of targeting. Uh, I clearly touched on it in my presentation. Uh, I think the other presentations also cover that area. I think it's, it's the direction that vector control is going, it's targeted, it's very specific, and it's environmentally friendly. Thank you, Mark. So, Ellie, would you like some thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm, it sounds like there's still a lot of questions on Sandfly, so I think I might just go and get a job working on Sandflies. <laughs> 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 um, no, but to be serious, um, I think definitely in my PhD, I, I've always been really interested in applied ways of controlling vectors for disease control. I always thought it's the way forward to do like basic applied technologies. And when I started my PhD, I thought, oh, this is kind of blue skies, and it's you know if it's if it's ever going to really be an applied way to control um, disease. And as I went through, I realized that actually, like the more you know about a vector, or the more you the more you know about parasite host uh, vertebrate interactions, then weird and wonderful ways to control vectors arise and it's only through learning more and more about the insect ecology or, or other interactions that you can develop novel ways of controlling disease so I think yeah just everybody keeps researching their their interesting old things and, and we'll come up with new ways of controlling disease. And then that Paul? Yeah I mean leishmaniasis has been for a long time remains one of those parasitic diseases targeted by WHO it is important. There are lots of people suffering from it. Um, chemotherapy has been assumed to be the immediate solution. The, and vaccines are thought to be the longer term solution. And of course, there's fascinating work on cell mediated immunity. Leishmaniasis is something of a model. Vector control has usually been dismissed. Whether it should be dismissed is another question. Um, one point I would like to make, I did briefly mention it in my talk, One Health, um, in zoonotic visceral cutaneous leishmaniasis, there are veterinary problems there, it would be helpful for epidemiologists, for transmission modelling, if some of the data available to the big pharma companies could be made available to the scientific community especially in Europe, where dogs are the main um, patients. I think that's a really good point, Mark. That's very cool to uh, say that the uh, data open access from all these different sectors, which have got something to do with vector virals and also disease control. Teresa, some thoughts? Yeah, I find it really fascinating how we are all working um, with the same aim to, to control um, the vector and to really make a change to some of the neglected tropical diseases out there. And um, as it has been such a variety, I think it certainly highlights or reflects the um, need to really collaborate and to learn from each other on the different approaches. Um, I believe there is not only one approach that um, is going to be the only one successful, and I am very grateful for having this um, platform here at ISNTD to really yeah, get to know each other and to um, come together with different ideas and hopefully um, put them all together and you know make, make a difference to the world. Thank you very much, I'm going to invite uh, Gabriel to do as well. Yeah, quite a tricky one, but I'll pick up from what you were just saying. So I think that. Um, the, Platforms like this are really good because people from all the different disciplines come together and that, that's really important. And, and it also, I was thinking similarly, um, we're up against difficulties of funding. People want something quick, you get two years of lots of money just to see if it is Two years is nothing. It's quite difficult to do the more difficult questions or the more difficult insects that you don't know much about. But also, the, the, the sort of blockages to be to do an interdisciplinary work. So all the things that I said about taxi and, 
and, and Skios in another project I worked on with Steve Tor as well, who was sung an often during instance these of how I was human body. So but trying to get funding to like put insecticides on cattle and kill tetra blood and destroys at the same time. But try and get funding that goes across the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture. So the funding bodies it's really crazy, even though these things could dovetail together with the Ministry of well, I completely agree, and I think it ties in marks for me. I also direct a, a different program at Canada, and we should talk to people who break down these silos between different disciplines so we have a more holistic view on vector control, be it bat flies or snails, even mosquitoes. We didn't really mention mosquito control with regard to uh, lymphatic filariasis, but there's a very clear uh, handshake there with uh, biting mosquito in terms of lymphatic transmission as well as um, malaria. But I think my words of wisdom is, is the fact that as a vector biologist, I suppose we have to think of local strategies, but how those local strategies then get dovetailed up to national and then global. The analogy I'd like to leave in your mind is we all like to think in the UK of national elections, and if you live in Scotland, Wales, or England, it's a slightly different take on what that policy is. And as we go down to local elections, I must admit personally, I don't take a lot of interest in local level interactions, but from a vector biology point of view, that's where the action happens, is that transmission first, uh, where you have to target and you have to apply your knowledge. But the difficulty then is applying that knowledge back up the process to convince people at local, districts, national, even global, to know what you're doing is important. So perhaps that's the words of wisdom for the, the coffee, which is now open. And then we're going to reconvene at 11.30 for uh, some workshops. So thank you for attending and also thank you for the